Hello, welcome to the week four lectures in Soccer 1010, and the four videos that I'm going to do this week are going to be discussing aspects of class and inequality, which, as we looked at in uh, week one, is one of the you know, very fundamental um, sociological concepts. So, by the end of these videos, um, I'll be discussing aspects about what inequality is and how the concept of class can help us sociologically analyse that. I'll be looking at the foundational works of Marx and Weber, um, whose work has been particularly um, influential on um, how understandings of classes developed throughout the 20th century and into the 21st. And in the last section, I'll briefly touch upon some um, relevance of class theories to Australia today. In this first section, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about some basic understandings of inequality and um, how class itself is thought of in more general society. So class is certainly not a popular concept in Australia. Um, it's not actually a term you'll hear a lot in the media, and it's not really something you'll hear much politicians talk about too much in particular. Um, and it's really not a concept that's discussed in the media too much, although there are examples of it sometimes that come up. Um, some that are somewhat sociological, and some that aren't so much, and I'll talk about um, aspects of those. Now, there's a number of historical reasons for this. You could speculate a kind of very idea of class about how some people intrinsically have, you know, more opportunities and advantages than others. Cuts again, cuts against many of the, um, you know, myths and uh, of Australian society as being egalitarian or the country of the fair go. It particularly foregrounds Australia as a colonial settler society, and this points back to our, you know, British colonial heritage. And again, that's something that's um, you know, largely marginalised in, in media and politics. And it certainly challenges the kind of dominant idea of societies and meritocracy, where that if you, know, you work hard, hard enough and you're talented enough, everyone has an equal opportunity to rise up to the top. Class theories show how, um, you know, while there's aspects of meritocracy that um, work in some situations or not, um, overall one's class position has a real effect on those kind of aspects of mobility. In terms of statistics, you know, the ABS doesn't really collect statistics on class relating to inequality. It tends to focus on things like geographical area and postcodes and, and stuff like that, or there's, you know, relations to various occupations, all of which make up different definitions of how we can formulate class. But, um, you know, statistics themselves are quite hard to find, except when done by more independent research in universities. So it's very rarely mentioned in mainstream politics and media, and these are the two kind of domains that constantly promote the myth of a classless society. But it's ironic that when class comes up in, you know, public discourse, it tends to kind of be almost reversed in its meaning. Um, you know, so when there's arguments made about, you know, redistributions of wealth, about, you know, taxing mining companies that, you know, are mostly offshore or, or you know, uh, mine coal and iron ore or whatever and the profits go offshore or, um, you know, the taxing of billionaires and that kind of stuff. These kind of arguments are often met with the idea that this is some kind of class war um, where there's a kind of politics of envy going on um, and exploits the hard work of those people. And I'll talk a little bit about aspects about that. Um, throughout the, this lecture. This also kind of relates to the constant kind of denigrating of um, working class people or unemployed people um, as undeserving and lazy poor, and you can see this, you know, constantly in things like the current affair and, and stuff like that. So, how is the term class used? There's lots of kind of non-sociological, more colloquial uses of the term, and you can think about it in terms of when something is described as classy, it tends to be something that's attractive, someone that's prosperous. It's even kind of used to describe people sometimes in sport that seem to like effortlessly have, you know, lots of skill or poise. There's notions of high class that tend to kind of relate to, you know, high quality or really good restaurant restaurants or something. But often those the term high class can be used to denote things like snobbishness and pretentiousness and stuff like that. I spoke a little bit about the kind of notions of class war and the politics of envy already, but in day-to-day -day life, there's all kinds of different terms that kind of point or, I suppose, um, um, 
mean different kind of class categories without really using the actual direct language of class and terms like bogan, westy, chav, hipster, tosser, yuppie, snob, all these kind of things are pointing to particularly um, cultural and symbolic aspects of class that I'll discuss in some detail later without really talking about class itself. Um, in terms of the sociological uses of what class is, um, there's a numerous different ways to, to conceive upon it. Um, Certainly, it relates to socioeconomic inequalities, um, and that I'll, I'll discuss those more in a minute. Um, and, you know, again, as I said already, uh, Marx and Weber, and particularly in more recent times, Bourdieu, have been conceptually um, helpful to think about how socioeconomic status uh, relates to, you know, various forms of life chances and things like that. Increasingly, though, class is also analysed in terms of the cultural, symbolic and relational terms that... Um, go beyond the kind of purely, you know, how much stuff we have and what we own, and think more about how class is bound up in the way that things like morals and tastes and values and ethics and even things like what's deemed to be good literature or popular culture are defined. Um, those kind of analyses show that, like, people with more cultural power they tend to be, you know, highly educated middle-class people have more ability to define those things and therefore create the world in their own image. Importantly, class is not just about disadvantage in that sense. Um, it's about advantage as well. So something like privilege is something that's increasingly being studied. This is often done in conjunction with studying ideas of whiteness and also in terms of masculinity. But um, what's interesting about this is the privileged as a class are quite difficult to research. They are not tend to be easy people to contact. They tend to say no a lot. Um, so in that sense like the wealth I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, their privilege is something that tends to be hidden. If you're interested in looking in privileged uh, and, and an Australian study of, of that, have a look at the book Ruling Class Men by Donaldson and Pointy. So let's take a step back from the conceptual understandings of class that I'll define more throughout the lecture and get a little bit of a look about the problem that class is useful for analysing, and that's inequality. So... If, you know, we can think about inequality in terms of levels of wealth. Um, wealth refers to total assets owned by an individual minus any debts. Um, what's interesting about this is, you know, it's almost a cliche that wealth can create wealth, you know, investments, dividends, ownership of property, you know, taking rents and all that kind of stuff. And, in, you know, the tax system has been increasingly geared towards the wealthy. You get a lot of kind of tax breaks and there's lots of kind of middle-class welfare involved in this, these kind of um, tax systems. Wealth is also really difficult to measure, and we'll go into that a little more on the next slide. But if you want to pause uh, here and um, click on that link, you'll be able to see some recent research that kind of sketches out um, inequalities and, and wealth in Australia. Now, in terms of wealth being difficult to measure... One of the reasons for that is that huge amounts of global wealth is hidden. Um, again, this like estimates here because it's hidden. But you know, one um, study, for instance, uh, estimated that 1.5 trillion dollars worth of wealth is hidden offshore. That's the entire um, GNP of the United States, the equivalent of it. So again, estimates here about one quarter of global wealth is held in these kind of tax haven accounts. So that's Wealth that's, you know, not taxed, that's hidden, it's just sitting there, um, you know, and, you know, you can imagine all the kind of different social, cultural, economic problems that could be solved um, if that wealth was put to, put to work. So this obviously makes wealth really difficult to measure because rich citizens are really good at hiding it. And you're, if you're interested in looking into an example of that, Check out the Panama Papers that were leaked in the 2016. There'll be a bunch of analysis of that online for you to be able to look at. One of the things in Australia that we kind of have as a kind of myth of what Australian society is, is that, you know, there's, there's the fair go that's egalitarian. This relates to our history in a way that back in the 1800s, around the gold rushes um, around the world, Australia was kind of seen as a working class paradise. And again, it ignores much of the kind of horrible racist and settler colonial relations that were going on at the time. But um, since then, that's kind of come to dominate the way many Australians think about themselves. But really, the kind of 
um, you know, stats about inequalities and certainly the kind of research that traces, um, you know, how people get into various positions and stuff like that shows that they tend to come from kind of very privileged backgrounds and often attended the same schools, um, are members of the same clubs and all that kind of stuff. In terms of wealth, um, proponents of kind of the dominant system argue that like levels of inequality are fine because it allows people to kind of have something to um, be ambitious about, um, that, you know, we live in this meritocracy that um, if everyone kind of tries hard enough, they'll be able to kind of get what they want. Um, so people see inequalities as a kind of incentive, um, as a way of kind of rewarding risk and effort. And I'll talk a little bit um, about why that kind of ignores many of the social problems and inequalities create um, by pointing to the spirit level at the end of this video. Um, and what it also ignores increasingly in terms of the sociological analysis of this is how the global north countries have exploited the global south um, in terms of their own wealth. Um, and we'll look at little, um, some aspects of that in the week on globalisation. So from a sociological perspective, most people that are interested in class fundamentally challenge this idea of the fair go. It's kind of a normal that we try and make look strange. Okay, so I've included some different stats here for you to look at. I'm not going to go through them too much in, in the video itself. I'll, you can pause it and kind of look at these kind of things yourselves. But one of the things I wanted to point out here is that I think many, um, many people tend to overestimate, um, over, overestimate what uh, they think the wealth, uh, wealthy is in Australia or kind of um, overestimate um, different levels of wealth. So this um, kind of cheat sheet here by the Grattan Institute highlight the different kind of ways of measuring wealth uh, in terms of taxpayers, workers, measuring adults, households, households adjusted for size, and can show you where the different kind of um, notion of average or mean lies. This is important because when we hear figures say that the average worker earns $90,000, most people imagine that as kind of, that's what the 50% mark is, but it really is not the case at all. This is um, increasingly problematic as the, you know, the top 1% earns more and more and more, and this fundamentally distorts what the, the, the average figure is in terms of what it represents. So you can have a look at that table there, and as this kind of breaks down a little bit more, kind of shows why the average isn't the average. In this one, I think the figures might be slightly older here, but, um, you know, the ratio still applies. Um, if you're earning 80, 82000 which is the average full-time salary, you're actually in the top 25% of earners. Um, in the fourth video, I've got a little website that you can go to and put your own income in there, and you can see where in the kind of percentage of wealth in the world, um, not just in Australia, but across the world, um, you rank. If you earn, say, $150,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of most wealthy people in the world. So again, these averages here kind of only can really display so much. They seem to be within countries distorted in terms of how people imagine what other people earn. Um, and when we kind of look at it at a more global level, certainly people in the wealthy global north, even if they're kind of maybe relatively lower in that system, will be kind of very high um, compared to other parts of the world. Another way of thinking of this is in the great book, uh, The Broken Ladder, which is by a guy called Keith Payne, um, which is mostly a kind of social psychology book about the way that inequality affects people's um, happiness and health and things like that, that um, the video I'm asking you to watch at the end of this section goes into in some detail. But I like this kind of um, graph here to kind of, I suppose, um, express, you know, the sheer inequality that kind of um, Western societies face. This is um, the US. Um, the vertical, vertical axis is income, horizontal axis is how many households in the US, um, you know, are in that band. You can see there that the vast majority of people are under $100,000. So the far left there is the, the poorest 20%. Once you get to the top of the shoes of that dude, you're basically at the half way point. And, you know, that's half, you know, the, the average household wage. Um, bottom 80% ends at um, 100000 sorry. sorry. And then the ultra wealthy go higher and higher and higher. But really, if you wanted to look at the ultra wealthy, that um, 
graph on the page there would actually be the kind of you know height of multi-story uh, buildings. You couldn't really able, you can't really accurately represent that kind of inequality on a page because um, you would have to start distorting the scale. So this is the kind of inequalities that are increasingly the norm, and as Thomas Piketty has pointed out, um, um, particularly Western societies, the global north at the moment, have levels of inequality that are kind of, we haven't really seen since the 1800s. Another kind of thing that's quite prominent in the media these days is how like billionaires are all here to save us and how much, you know, wealth they give. And this kind of often relates to what's called the trickle down effect where, you know, the wealthy will rise all people up and, you know, they're charitable and all this kind of stuff as well. And I think this table uh, is, nicely expresses the kind of myth of that. Now, remember, all this kind of wealth here, will look, like many of these people on this list will have gone up a lot in the last couple of years. The pandemic has actually been really good for billionaires, uh, many of them anyway. Um, and in terms of the kind of amount of money they give, most of them give a tiny amount of their wealth away. Um, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon in 2018, you know, gave away 0.01%. It's probably about the equivalent of me giving, I don't know, 100 bucks to charity a year. So again, just kind of pointing out these representations here of wealth, about where it goes. I mean, in terms of making a positive um, con contribution to societies and social problems, if these kind of billionaires actually pay their fair share of tax, um, that percentage would be much more in terms of the way it contributes to society. Okay, and in the last... Um, how I want to conclude this kind of description of inequality is for you to watch the TED Talk by Richard Wilkinson, um, who is one of the co-authors of the book The Spirit Level. Now, um, this book, I think, and the talk here beautifully shows how much of a social problem inequality is. Um, it points out that the most unequal societies, whether that's countries measured as a whole, or even broken down into kind of states in some places as well, the more unequal those societies are, the more likely they are to have crime problems, health problems, um, literacy problems, all kinds of social problems. The more equal societies are, the less likely they are to have those problems. What's really interesting about this is once you get to a certain level of wealth across a country, the actual wealth of the country overall doesn't matter. If it's a more comparatively rich country or a more comparatively poor country, if those countries are relatively even and have less inequality, they're likely to have less social problems. If they're rich or poor, but still have lots of inequality within them, they're likely to have more social problems. So to conclude this part of the lecture, I'd like you to click on that link and uh, watch that TED Talk. Thanks.